Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this service coming from Killin Parish Church. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. One intimation today, uh, Killin Church will open next Sunday, that's Sunday the 25th, for the first time in over six months. Um, the usual time at 10 o'clock, but we would ask that if you're coming along, uh, that you would come early, because with all the restrictions, it'll take a, a, a moment or two to get everyone seated properly. So please make sure that you come in good time for that. Balquidder has already been open for two weeks now, and it has gone uh, very well there, despite the restrictions. So I look forward to seeing you here in Killin. Uh, next Sunday. These recordings will continue, although both churches will be open in the next few weeks, uh, and it will be a different uh, topic and service from what will take place in the church, because I know many of you who will come to church will still want uh, to be able to look at the recordings. Let's light our candle. We do this while we think of all those who need God's grace at this time. Say the affirmations with me. The light of the world has come. Jesus is the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness will never overcome it. Amen. And now Morag will lead us in prayer and read the lesson for today. Let us pray. Lord God, you know that we live scattered lives and cannot come together to this sanctuary. But we are together in spirit and we seek our unity in the Spirit. We seek the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we seek your peace, God our Father. We are your people, and we are gathered together in spirit to pray to you now. Lord God, you are a great God. You are gracious and compassionate, patient and faithful, slow to anger and rich in love. You are good to all. Father God, your love is at work in all that you have made. In Jesus Christ, Son of God, in your likeness we are made new. And Holy Spirit, you touch our lives with hope. We pray to you now, three in one. Hear all of our prayers, spoken and silent. You are a holy God, giver of light and grace, where we have sinned against you and against our fellow men and women. Sometimes through ignorance, through weakness, or through our own deliberate fault, we have forgotten your love, or betrayed your trust, and be our sorry. And we repent of all our sins. We think of now of the things that we know we have done that have not pleased you this week. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and lead us out from darkness to walk as your children in the light. Jesus, you died and rose again for us. We humbly and thankfully accept your forgiveness and receive now your peace. Father God, you have called us together in mind and spirit, if not in body, in the name of Jesus Christ. In him and through him, we praise you. For the gift of your son, our saviour, born a child, growing to maturity, teaching your truth, healing the sick, befriending sinners, crucified at Calvary, then risen, ascended, and now with us forever. 
Lord, from our hearts, we thank you for all that you offer us through Christ, for the leading and the strengthening of the Holy Spirit, for our baptism, for growing in faith, for your word and for communion, for the fellowship of others in the church living in this place and across the world. Lord, from our hearts, we thank you. Rejoicing in these blessings from you and trusting in your loving care for all of us, we bring you now our prayers for the world. We pray for the world that you've created, for those who rebuild where things have been destroyed, for those who fight hunger, poverty and disease, for those who have power to bring change from the, for the better and to renew hope. We pray for them encouragement and that they might not give up, but keep going. And where we can encourage them, help us to do so. We pray for our country, for our queen and her family, for our government and those making laws and having to make new laws and new rules at this difficult time. Being a leader is a hard task and often the people that they make rules for don't appreciate them. We know this at the moment. We pray for wisdom for them, for wise counsellors around them, for them to listen to the advice they are given. And where we can help and encourage by prayer or uh, wise counsel, pray that you would help us to do that. We pray for people who are in need, those for whom life is a struggle at the moment, those whose lives have included death or loss, pain or disability, discouragement, fear, shame or rejection. In the lives of those in need, we pray for your everlasting arms to be under them and for us where we are able to be your arms and your hands and your feet to these people. And we pray for those in the circle of friendship and love that you have placed around us, for children or parents brothers or sisters, friends or neighbours, and for those especially in our thoughts today. In the lives of those we love, we pray for your protection and for your presence to be with them. And we pray for this church, in this place, we give thanks to you for the community of faith into which you have placed us. Thank you for the reading of scripture, for all the years that there have been songs sung and the people who built this sanctuary, for the ministers who have come and taught us to know and trust you. Pray that you would help us to live faithfully as the people before us have done and to provide generously for the next generation until you bring us with all your people into the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and with you, the Father, and Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are three in one. We, we praise you forever in joy for all eternity. And we finish with the words uh, that Jesus taught us uh, when we pray, and we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we come now to our reading which is from John chapter 1. And I am reading from verses 35 to 51. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning round, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? 
Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen. What a wonderful passage that is. It's packed with lots of goodies. Amazing characters, amazing designations and affirmations are made about Jesus. For example, John the Baptist refers to him as the Lamb of God, and then he's called Rabbi, Son of God, King of Israel, Son of Man, uh, and of course the one prophesied in the Law and the Prophets. All the characters begins with John the Baptist and his two disciples. And John the Baptist points out Jesus to them. One of them is Andrew, brother, uh, the, the brother of Peter. And they go to speak to Jesus and they spend the whole day with him. And then in the light of that, Andrew excitedly goes and seeks out Peter to tell him, we have found the Messiah. And that's the theme for today. We have found the Messiah. And then Jesus seeks out Philip, and Philip is bowled over, and Philip seeks out Nathaniel to tell him again that we've discovered or found the one that the prophets and the law uh, point to and, and tell us about. And so it goes on. We have this sense of something magnetic and energetic happening. And we have all these designations made about Jesus. And we can put that into three kind of sections. First, there's the encounter with Jesus. And as a result of that encounter, the people who have that encounter experience certain things about him. And then they express that in a variety of ways. As you know, we've been going through the story of the ichthus, and we're on to the second letter. The, the I there stands for Jesus. We looked at that last week. Uh, just simply Jesus or Yeshua in Hebrew, which means Joshua. Moving to the next one, that looks like an X there, uh, the Greek letter, and we get the CH from that of the ichthus, and it stands for Christos, uh, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Mashiach, which is Messiah. Now, Messiah is quite simply the anointed one. And it refers very much to the kings of, of ancient Israel being anointed at their coronation. 
because they were agents for God. They were his representative to rule with justice and fairness uh, and with righteousness. And they were a channel for God's grace within the nation. And the two great kings of Israel, uh, we have David and Solomon, and that was the high point uh, for the nation. But then there was the, the Babylonian invasion, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and then the exile. A return from the exile, but the Jewish people still under the domination of the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the Romans. And there developed a longing for a, a king, a ruler, uh, a Mashiach, who would come and help the people, deliver them from bondage, be a, a, a savior for them. And that's the longing that makes the, the cultural context within which Jesus was operating. So what's going on here? Well, quite simply, for some reason, those who encountered Jesus realized he was somebody incredibly special. And they were convinced that they had found the Messiah. And that was during his ministry and his life. They thought he was someone special. An encounter with him was life-changing. And after his death, quite simply, within the first two decades after the death of Jesus, we have all the fundamental doctrines and worldview of the Christian church already in place. So they built on that confession that Jesus was the Messiah very, very quickly. It wasn't a long, drawn-out period of adding to what this original story had been. It was immediate, and it was um, full of energy and purpose and conviction because that encounter had meant so much. And it was sealed by the resurrection. Without the resurrection, everything would have died. It would have been a the dream would have turned into a nightmare. But for all the roller coaster uh, journey that the disciples were on, they became convinced that Jesus was the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ. But not in the way that people commonly had been expecting. He wasn't a deliverer from the Romans. He didn't come with an army or raise an army to do that. It was a different type of uh, messiahship. And it involved the establishment of the kingdom of God. Now, what we have to remember here, quite simply, is the distinction between what's known as the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. Big question for us is, as we saw last week about Jesus... Just simply Yeshua, Joshua, from Nazareth in Galilee, a peasant village. Did you note Nathaniel's response when Philip said, we found the Messiah? What, Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And he was a Jew. So you can imagine concentric circles going out. Nazareth was not a place of importance. And what is amazing is in the writings of ancient history, there's no reference to Nazareth outside the New Testament. Why? Well, because, well, they usually say that history is written by the victors, but it also was written by the elite because only a small percentage could read and write in the ancient world. But 5%, it's not a lot. So a place like Nazareth would would never be mentioned. A, play, a person like Yeshua from Nazareth would never be mentioned. But here he is. So how do we get from Josh, from Galilee, to the Christ? What on earth was going on there? What a leap that is. And it comes down to the extraordinary person that Jesus was, the encounter people had with him, and how they expressed that. Something wonderful was taking place. Now, the Jesus of history versus the Christ of faith is what we encounter all the time in our modern world. Every single Christmas, every single Easter, there's some documentary on the television 
with scholars giving their, their latest theory on what happened at first Christmas or what happened that first Easter and who Jesus was. And many people outside the faith dismiss it all. Well, Jesus was just some kind of rabbi. He was, he was just a teacher, a Jewish teacher. Or he was some kind of charismatic preacher and healer. Or he was a social revolutionary. That's why he was killed. Because, you know, he was fighting for the poor and, and those who were, were outside the pale of normal society. And so it goes on. And there's many parts to that, but so many different scholars have different views of the Jesus of history. So who is the Jesus of history? And when you take the Jesus of history, you then dismiss the Christ of faith because that's what the religious people, the disciples were all muddled. They got it confused. It all grew and developed out of nothing. And of course, it happened over centuries. Well, what I'm saying to you is it didn't happen over centuries. Within the first two decades, within the first 20 years of the church, we get in the New Testament documents all the great affirmations about Jesus. This was an impact that was immediate. So how did Josh Yeshua from Nazareth come to be seen as the Messiah? That's the question that the Christian faith has always said, well, unpack it. There's a lot here. If you're interested to know whether this is true or not, then there's a lot that needs to be wrestled with and engaged with, and I would encourage people to do that. But we in the church have got no need to be embarrassed. The Jesus of history for us is also the Christ of faith. And exus, that symbol, that anagram, points to that. That, that second uh, word, Christos. It's Jesus Christ. Now, Christ is not a name. It's a title. Jesus the Christ. We're not talking about like Tom Jones, son of God, Savior. It, the Ixus anagram is Jesus the Christ, son of God, Savior. It's a title, and we often forget that. And in the New Testament, for example, Paul's letters, we have Jesus referred to as Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, or sometimes just Christ. And what are the followers of Jesus called? Not Jesusites, not Nazarites, but Christians. We're called Christians, followers of the Messiah. So Yeshua became the Mashiach in the eyes of his followers. Wow! That demand some more investigation. So we in the church would hold Jesus out to you and say there is no distinction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. They're one and the same. God has done something marvelous in history in and through Jesus. And the story that we've just looked at, the impact he had on people, he's still having that impact today. Now, there's reference to Bethsaida, uh, Peter and Andrew, uh, and uh, Philip came from Bethsaida. That's, that is a town, or a, sorry, a village. The word actually means house of fish. It was a fishing village. They were fishermen. And there's a lot of fishing going on, isn't there? Jesus said that he wanted the disciples to be fishers of men. Well, he fishes for them too. It was customary that a rabbi would be approached by people wanting to be learners. They made the initiative, and the rabbi selected. In the New Testament, it's Jesus who does the selecting. It's Jesus who uh, uses his initiative, and he calls them out. He chooses them. He fishes for them, and he captures them. But within that, the disciples themselves excitedly go and bring the others in. Andrew goes to Peter. We've found the Messiah. Philip goes to Nathaniel. You'll never guess who I've just met. I don't know where you are in your faith, or maybe you're not even in the faith, you're just on the periphery and you're interested. Can I say to you, take a further step. Jesus is calling you. In Revelation 3.20, there's this wonderful phrase. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter in and eat with them and they with me. 
maybe he's calling you today. Maybe he's knocking on your door today. Are you willing to open that door? Are you willing to take the step forward to investigate even further how this Yeshua became the Christ? And if he's the Christ, what does that mean for you? Or maybe your faith has grown a little bit cold. It's been difficult times these last six months, hasn't it? And maybe the fire of faith has dulled a little bit. Well, let it spark and let it grow again. Jesus calls each and every one of us in his church this day to discipleship, to learning. And that's the message and the challenge for you and certainly for me in these days. Once again, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Let me conclude with the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.